Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When calling a play, the ideal scenario is that both the head coach and the quarterback are on the same page. The two see eye to eye, they agree with each other philosophically, and they both think that calling this play is the right thing to do. If it doesn't work out, it's not because the two parties clash and disagree. But sometimes, you'll see one side win out. Either the head coach will call a play that the quarterback doesn't want to run, or the quarterback will call a play that the head coach doesn't want his quarterback making. These things, while not necessarily ideal, happen over the course of a game. But how about this? How about a time where a play was called where the quarterback didn't want to run it and the head coach didn't want to run it? Neither party thought that the play was a good idea, but it ended up working out and was the reason why the game was won. It's a bizarre situation, but it's happened before. In a 1982 game between the Pittsburgh Steelers and Cincinnati Bengals, the Steelers won thanks to some incredible drama behind the scenes. And this is the story behind that. Before talking about the play, we need some context leading up to the play. It's September 19, 1982, and we're at Three Rivers Stadium for this AFC Central rivalry between the Cincinnati Bengals and Pittsburgh Steelers. This is a huge game, and on paper, it might be the most attractive game of the entire week. You've got a team off the heels of an incredible dynasty in Pittsburgh, and the defending AFC champion in Cincinnati. Obviously, you have a strike looming in the distance, with the possibility that this could be the last game we see for a while. But regardless of how many games get played this season, the fact that one of these teams can start 2-0 is a big deal. This is the true definition of a back and forth affair, with absolutely nothing separating the two sides. Pittsburgh got the scoring going after they scored on their opening drive of the game, when Terry Bradshaw hit John Stallworth on a 15-yard touchdown pass to give Pittsburgh a 7-0 lead. At halftime, the Steelers lead 10-3, but Cincinnati tied the game to start the third quarter off when Pete Johnson punched it in from a yard out. As a side note, I made a video about Pete Johnson, which you can check out in the upper right corner. The teams went back and forth again, with Benny Cunningham scoring from two yards out, and then Pete Johnson adding his second touchdown of the game with a nine-yard score. Late in the fourth, Cincinnati takes its first lead of the game on a 31-yard field goal by Jim Breach. With four and a half minutes left, Cincinnati was looking to win their fifth straight game against Pittsburgh. However, the Steelers are able to get themselves down the field, which puts the game in the hands or should I say the feet, of rookie kicker Gary Anderson. It's a 42-yard field goal, and he nails it. With one minute left, it's all tied up. And after a late drive by Cincinnati ends with a blocked field goal, we're heading into overtime. For the first time in the history of this rivalry, we're playing an extra period of football. And that's where chaos ensues. In the overtime period, Cincinnati gets the ball to start things off. It's an absolute disaster. On third down, Ken Anderson throws a terrible interception right into the hands of Dwayne Woodruff, who read that all the way. He's able to take it all the way down to the two-yard line. At this point, most teams would do one of two things with the ball that close to the goal line, knowing that the very next score wins the game. Option number one is to run the ball, punch it in, and get the touchdown that way. However, Terry Bradshaw did not want to do that. As Bradshaw said, initially, I wanted to kick the field goal. Why waste time? But Chuck Noll wanted to run the ball. And I didn't want to run the ball. I didn't feel comfortable running it. Too many things can happen. What would lead Bradshaw to make such comments? Well, he had a reason to not feel too comfortable with this. For one, the Steelers could get absolutely nothing going on the ground all day. Cincinnati had stuffed Pittsburgh in that department. On 17 carries, the Steelers picked up a grand total of 26 yards. Their longest run of the game was a mere five yards. It's one of the best performances by a run defense that you're gonna see. Cincinnati's three starters on the defensive line were all first-round picks in Eddie Edwards, Wilson Whitley, and Ross Browner. And man, did it show on this day. Plus, if the ball was going to anyone at the goal line, it was going to be Franco Harris. Credit to Harris because he's one of the greatest to ever do it. But to say that he had a fumbling problem was an understatement, and Bradshaw recognized this. In the three seasons prior to 1982, there had been just five players in the league to fumble at least 24 times. Harris was one of them. In fact, entering this game, he had the most fumbles in NFL history by any non-quarterback, having put the ball on the ground 79 times in his career. And in 1979, Bradshaw witnessed this firsthand when on the goal line, the ball went to Franco Harris, and he fumbled. I made a video about that game if you want to check that out in the upper right corner. Plus, the Steelers put the ball on the ground three times in their Week 1 game against Dallas. Bradshaw didn't want to take any chances, 
and just want to kick the field goal right away and get the heck out of there. That takes us to option number two, which is to kick the 19-yarder. Kick what essentially boils down to an extra point and win it. But Chuck Knoll didn't want to do that. His fears, much like Bradshaw's, were somewhat justified and based on precedent. Number one, putting your faith on the feet of a rookie kicker in his second game ever is an awfully risky proposition, especially when you weren't the one to draft him. Granted, Gary Anderson was perfect on that day and hit the game tying field goal from 42 yards out, but he had a missed kick in week one against Dallas. I think a bigger reason why Noel didn't want to do this, though, is because of what happened in 1981. In a game against the Seahawks, Pittsburgh blew a 21-3 lead and trailed 24-21 in the fourth quarter. Instead of going for it on fourth down and trying to win it with a touchdown, the Steelers lined up for a chip shot field goal. David Trout misses it badly. Game over. Seahawks win. It wouldn't shock me if that incident traumatized Noel enough to not want to kick a field goal unless it was absolutely necessary. If you're keeping track at home, Noel wants to run the ball. Bradshaw wants to kick the field goal. In the end, the Steelers do something that neither Noel nor Bradshaw wanted to do. And the end result? Roll the tape. 2020 is the score in overtime. Game's over. Touchdown Steelers, John Stallworth. Bradshaw to Stallworth. Touchdown Steelers and Pittsburgh wins again. Terry Bradshaw to John Stallworth for a two-yard touchdown. It was Stallworth's second touchdown catch of the day, and it was the game winner. Steelers win 26-20 and head into the strike with a perfect record. And after the game, the general mood was confusion. Nobody knew what the heck just happened. As Noel said, I don't think anyone wanted his play. Bradshaw was able to convince Noel to call the play, with Noel saying that there wasn't anyone on our coaching staff who would have gone with it. But Bradshaw must have seen something, because he said the moment he lined up, he knew it was going to be a touchdown. You know the old saying that two wrongs don't make a right? Well, that was disproven here. We've seen some crazy finishes to games between these two teams, from the final game of the 2006 season where the Steelers won in overtime to knock Cincinnati out of postseason contention, to the wildcard meeting in the 2015 postseason. I think people are still having trouble processing how that game ended. But this one deserves some love too. A play that nobody wanted somehow works out. On this day in 1982, everyone won when no one was happy. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters to help get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below. 